Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's uh, webinar. This is the fourth in our series uh, of Sharing is Learning uh, 2020 Spring Webinar Series. Uh, my name is Del Spafford, um, and I'm the regional teacher trainer and academic consultant for Macmillan Education. Just to do a quick tech check, so could you please tell me if you can hear me? Now, instead of just writing yes, can you tell me where you are? So are you at home? Are you in your office? And which country you are in? So I am in my home in Nantaburi, Thailand. Home in India, okay. Home in Vietnam. School, good, good, good. Okay. All right. Lovely. Okay, great. So thank you. Now it's clear that most of you are, some, a lot of you are at home, but some of you are at the office at school, which is great to see. Um, I'm glad that people are out there uh, being able to go to work. So it seems that things are moving nicely. So welcome again. Thank you so much for giving us your time this morning. Um, for those that, that were here on Tuesday, we're going to follow obviously the similar format. We'll be here for about an hour and we will have a Q&A session at the end as well. So Macmillan Education is the organization I work for and we are a publishing company and we work with schools uh, throughout the region and throughout the world. Um, we've been advancing learning for 175 years or over 175 years. Um, and we work with uh, teachers in a number of different uh, institutions. So our three main areas are language learning, so English language teaching, which I assume most of you will be involved in. Uh, we also work in curriculum, so this means we work in, in schools teaching other subjects such as science, geography, maths, that kind of thing. And we also work with universities and colleges, so we partner with these organizations to help people prepare for their, um, their lives outside of their normal education. Today we're going to really sort of be focusing on uh, ELT, on language teaching, and we're going to be looking at kind of young adults and, and adults. However, please don't leave if you uh, teach primary or secondary, because I think a lot of these uh, ideas that I'm going to show you and the, and the message that I want to get across will, uh, will transfer, will, will, will go across uh, many different levels. So my title of today's session is Sharing is Learning, Producing Confident Communicators Inside and Outside Our English Classroom. So I'm going to show you uh, some, some ideas um, using a course book that you can see behind me. Um, and I want you to think as you go through the session how you can adapt these uh, ideas for your own teaching context. We're going to look at two areas. We're going to look at what we call unit orders, so the first page uh, of our course books. And we're going to look at some ideas about how we can adapt these ideas and these examples and activities. And then we're going to look after that at some dedicated speaking activities that you'll be able to uh, be able to apply for your classrooms as well. Okay, it seems I'm breaking up a little bit. All right, let me, okay, let me just uh, stop for a moment. And can I just do another quick tech check? Are we good um, with my voice and being able to see me okay? So I'll keep talking just to do this uh, tech check. It's a little bothering. A lack of connection, can't hear easily. All right, now it's good. All right, well, I'm getting a, a little, okay, okay, it's getting better now. All right, well, I'm going to continue. I can see um, that my internet connection um, is okay on my screen. So I'll keep going and we'll keep monitoring this uh, as we go on. I'm gonna start the session with a metaphor. Now, I'm gonna show you a picture which illustrates a metaphor that I would like you to consider. So, 
here we have a picture of a fighter, a boxer, or maybe a mixed martial artist, and he's there with his coach or his trainer. Now, this metaphor, um, or a metaphor, is a word or a phrase or an idea that means one thing and is used for referring to another thing. So, I would like you to speak your mind, okay? What is my metaphor? What is the picture I am trying to illustrate to you? What is the message I'm trying to give to you? Can you type your ideas in the chat box? <clears throat> coaching, yeah. Now that the coaching is, is kind of literally, he is coaching his fighter. Motivation, never give up, good, yeah. Okay. The fight, courage, good. These are all really cool words, aren't they? Giving support. Keep going, yeah. Never give up. Okay, lovely. So what I'm trying to look at here in this picture, and I'll give you some background, is when I uh, was doing uh, some some preparation for this session. I saw a an article in the English Teaching Professional, and it was a really cool article. And it was talking about metaphor in language teaching, and they were actually talking about uh, assessment and using metaphors to um, to show the different forms of assessment. And then I saw a really cool um, kind of a meme. So there was a coach that I really like. Uh, a, a fighting trainer that I really like. And he was uh, talking about the things that he needs to be able to do to help his fighters. And I thought about it. Now, I'm not a fighter. I've never, I've never had a fight in my life, but I am a teacher. And I kind of related to what he was saying with my... So he was saying that six things a trainer should know. So a trainer should know the fighter's purpose and the goals for fighting. All right. So these these kind of these six areas were very important. Now there was more areas actually that he spoke about. I've just taken these out because these resonated with me. These these I thought were quite useful. And what I did was I just changed the word fight for the word learn. And I've created the similar maxims because they are very similar. So my metaphor has changed to a teacher. So these are the things that I was kind of thinking about as a teacher and throughout my career of teaching. These are the these are kind of maxims that I really that I have stood by um, in some form or other. So six things a teacher should know should know your learner's purpose and the goals for learning. These are very important maxims to take forward so i'm going to give you a minute to read those and then in the chat box can you tell me what you think is the most important maxim from my list for you so but you said f good care for their learners their goals alfina says c yeah Okay, good, lots of differences. F's coming through quite strong. I like that. Teachers are carers, right? A's, A's are coming through. Yeah, you've got another purposes. Okay, lovely. All right, so all of them, yeah, okay. F, D's, and B. So we've got different opinions here and that's great we're going to have these different opinions what i'm going to try to do is is put some of these maxims these these uh, ideas into some of the activities that we'll see throughout today's session and and show you how when we're thinking about what activities we're doing without all of them are important for sure when we're thinking about um what we're doing with our students we can relate it back to our own personal feelings about what we know we should be doing as a teacher. Now, I mixed my metaphor a little bit. You can see there's a picture of me uh, at the top as a fighter, but I'm not really a fighter. I just like to uh, exercise hitting that heavy bag. I don't hit any people, um, thankfully, and they don't hit me. Um, but I also wanted to mix the metaphor a little bit because 
even as teachers, we should also think ourselves as learners. And I guess that's why you're here today, right? You want to uh, you want to learn, you want to get better at your jobs. And this is what we should be striving for us to do and then all for, also for our students to do. And I guess this one looks at lead by example and create trust with our learners. So this is what I wanted to show you there. So today's session is going to look at three a three-step approach, if you like. So ideally, our kind of uh, what we should be looking at is creating an environment that our students feel comfortable in, that they feel motivated to learn and express ideas freely. They are not afraid to make mistakes. They can communicate with the, with confidence. So with this, we are we are showing that we care for our learners and their goals and their safety. And when I think about safety, I'm not thinking about health and safety. I'm thinking about a safe environment to practice language, to not be afraid to make mistakes. In fact, to embrace making mistakes. By making mistakes, we're showing that we're learning and have their backs or providing support. And we're going to look at these three key areas. So we have confidence. The peacock represents confidence that our students uh, can show and, and be happy to to develop. We have the lady who is who is practicing her speaking, so she represents the the opportunity to speak in the classroom. And then we have the the child who's playing Jenga. So this talks about strategies that we can develop and learn and help our students to uh, to develop so that they can become better independently as well. And I said, as I said, we're going to look at two areas. We're going to look at these unit openers, which we can see in the front of every uh, every course book that we that usually every course book that we pick up will have a unit opener. And we're going to look at how we can use these unit openers to really uh, get our students on the right path to communicate. And then we're going to look at some dedicated speaking activities. And I'm glad that people are writing in the chat box. Um, Hinishka wrote, um, if a child feels wanted, he or she will be more adaptive and attentive too. Yeah. So please, even though, as I said, this uh, material is designed for young adults and adults, think about if you're teaching primary, how you can adapt it for your primary students as well. Because the maxims that I showed you before uh, go across all uh, levels of teaching, everything that we teach. So our unit openers, let's have a look at how they start. Now, at the top, you will see the signposting here. Let me just check I've got my pointer on. So at the top, you will see the, the signposting here for you to show that unit openers are designed for, what does the peacock represent? Can you remember? Yes, but a bit. thank you, you were listening. Henry, good. Yeah, so peacock represents building that confidence. So our unit openers help us to build our confidence. They give the students a, fun, a fundamental foundation throughout the unit, all right? So they're designed to guide the students through the unit and to support them. Now, within the unit opener, there are kind of what I've, what I've looked at as being four different areas within this unit opener that I'm showing you. So they're designed to activate schemata. Now, anybody that was here on Tuesday would know what activate schemata is. But can you just can I just check again? Can you just tell me in chat box what does it mean to activate schemata? Prior knowledge, yes. Background knowledge, yeah. Okay, good. Yes. So this is finding out. What the students already know yeah their prior knowledge these unit openers they provide a model for discussion all right so this is uh, providing an example for our students so it's kind of leading by example i suppose which we're going to look at they encourage students to speak very very important the title of the material is called speak your mind so you can be sure that there are lots of opportunities for our students to speak and they provide a sense of progress. And I'll talk a bit more about a sense of progress and how important this is for our students. So 
So activating schemata. What do our students already know? Background knowledge, our prior knowledge. So the question here is a really simple question, but it's really powerful. What do you already know? OK, it's not asking the class what they know. It's asking you. It's individually tailored. It's asking the student what they already know. They're working alone. All right. And this approach is, is the first stage of what we call cooperative learning. So students are working alone. It's an easy task to achieve. They just have to say what they already know, of course. And it's highly personalized. It's got the word you in it. OK, so what do you already know is a really simple but nice question to ask somebody, ask the students. And what we're trying to do here really is to brainstorm. So the question it asks is think about your day and the things you do at school or work, the things you do with your family and with friends. And then they write the activities and the percentage of time they do the activities in that week. It's a very simple idea, and it's a very simple brainstorm. So we would have students brainstorm by themselves, and they would write this in their student book on the page here. All right, so they have their, their record of brainstorm, of words that they've brainstormed in their student books. So when we're brainstorming, it's quite a, an easy task for anybody, any of us to do. We're just writing down words that we know. If we have a class of mixed ability, and in fact, there's no point in saying if we have, we always have classes of mixed ability. So how can we make this a bit more of a challenge and a bit more focused for those students that are very strong learners? So with this, we're going to use what's called a Klein. So the students can brainstorm using a Klein. A Klein is a scale of vocabulary items. So with this list of vocabulary, the activities that they do at school, at work, with family and with friends, they can put it in how often they do the activities. So on their Klein, they will write the words along the Klein, depending on whether they do the activity a lot, a lot at 100%, or zero, hardly, hardly ever. Hopefully nothing will be zero because they won't be writing things that they don't do. If you're thinking of uh, other uh, topics of vocabulary, so let's think about uh, maybe even uh, teaching items of furniture, which we're going to look at later, you could have students record the items of furniture on a scale from size, so from small to big. So if you're enlisting, uh, items of furniture, chair, table, um, wardrobe, etc. then they would write them according to their size. If you are teaching animals, for example, with children, you could have them with scariest to the tamest. You could have fastest to slowest, biggest to smallest, the big, the, the big to small as well. So there are many ways that you can adapt these clients to add an element of focus instead of just writing down um, the words um, on a piece of paper in no particular order. The next stage is a share and compare. So here, this is the second stage to cooperative learning. So we have the first stage working alone, second stage, working together as a pair. Now, if we're doing a brainstorm, we can easily get students to compare their books, all right? And they can share and write down uh, their words that the other students have chosen in their books. And what we can also do is use some digital options. Now, I'm going to try here to show you some really cool, two really cool digital brainstorming tools. And I am going to pray. I know I can see we're having a couple of internet problems, but hopefully um, most of us will be able to use these ideas. Hen Henry, I love Mentimeter. Yeah, we're going to look at that again because I, I, I like it too. The first thing we're going to do though is very simple activity using Google Sheets. Now what I'm going to get you to do is the same activity that you can see in the student book here. So it's this activity. Think about your day and the things you do at school or work. 
with family and with friends. So start now to think about all the activities that you do through the day. All right. Don't type anything in the chat box just yet. All right. We're not going to use the chat box for this activity. It would be just too crazy. There's 360 people. So it would be a challenge for me to monitor that. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to put you into groups. Now, group one, you are students, all right, or participants or teachers that have a birthday from the first of the month to the fifth of the month, okay? That is group one. Group two, you are from the sixth to the tenth. Group three, you are from the 11th to the 15th. Group four, 16th to the 20th. Group five, 21st to the 25th. And group six, from the 26th to the 31st. Now, don't worry if you didn't quite catch that because the instructions are in the Google slide. So I'm now going to share my screen with you. And everybody, please pray that the internet is strong and will work. Okay, I've said my prayer. So let's have a look at my Google Sheets. So quick question, can you all see my Google Sheet? Okay, let me go back to the, okay, you can see it now, all right? When I share my screen, I can't see myself, so it's, I have to keep going back to the chat box. Lovely job, all right. Let me just see if I can pull that across a little bit and see if I can work this. All right, there we go. Okay, I'm getting lots of yeses, so I'm going to keep going. So what I would like you to do is to fill in our Google Sheet, very simply. So you can't do that yet because I haven't shared the Google Sheet with you. So in the chat box, I am now going to share. So all I need to do, I've created the Google Sheet in advance, and I'm just going to share. I'm going to copy the link. And I'm going to paste the link into the chat box now. So if you click on that link, you can now start, start adding your words to the group that you're designated in. So I'm going to give you a minute just to start adding your words. Let's see how you get on. Get a couple of can't opens. All right, let me try. Let me just have a look at that again. Let me refresh it. Ah, the farm might be due to heavy traffic, potentially, yeah. So I tell you what, let's try, here, here we go, watching Netflix, some people are writing. Okay, so Google Docs might be, uh, might not be ideal for 383 people. So why don't we just stick to group one? Can you write your words, group one? Only group one. And I'll try and refresh it one more time. Okay, we're getting some words here now. And what I'll do is I'll keep refreshing it. What I suggest is if you have 
a class of 380 students. Maybe, uh, no, it, you can edit it for sure. It's already being uh, edited, as, as you can see. It's just that there's a lot of you, which is causing the um, causing it to uh, overload a little bit. So let me just give you uh, one more second, um, and we will go back to the presentation. All right. So I've got a couple of. Uh, it didn't. It didn't work perfectly, but I think that's mainly down to the fact that um, we are looking at a lot of people using the actual presentation uh, tool itself. But what I really like about the Google Sheets is that you can keep it open forever. So as long as you have that link, you can keep typing um, and keep adding to the document. Um, it's a really nice way of, of creating a document that goes throughout the whole term. Um, if you're um, interested in keeping word lists, for example, for your students. So I think that worked not perfectly, but it, but it was all right. We got some ideas. Let's now have a look at this Mentimeter and show you how we can collaborate and produce some wonderful word clouds. Now, again, I'm going to pray even harder this time. And I'm going to share my screen. We'll go to our Mentimeter. So all you have to do is go to menti.com and type in the code. Now, I've changed the focus of the vocabulary here, and I just want you to think about your favorite teacher at school or university and write some adjectives to describe him or her. So menti.com is your website at the top. Type in the code 242215 and start entering your words. I'll give you a moment to do this. Write them in the menti.com. Here we go. It's nice now. Left wing, that's a nice word. Okay, we've got eight, nine. I'm just going to give you a few. I'll give you maybe a, another 30 seconds. And imagine you're in the classroom and this is on the screen and everybody's contributing. It's really motivating. It's beautiful to look at. And it also is really useful in terms of collaborating and um, sharing our, our work. Drop dead gorgeous. That's a very nice description of a, of a teacher. And you might notice that some of the words are bigger than the others. And this uh, indicates the frequency that students or, or that participants like yourself have, have written these words. So you can see the word patient, kind, strict are coming through very strongly. So these are the most frequent words that we've all been added, we've all added to this document. Now, unlike Google Docs, the Mentimeter only stays open for a couple of days. So you need to use this uh, sort of only only once, really. But you can uh, copy and paste them and use them again for different presentations. So I'll let you keep playing with that, and I'll come back to that in a moment and see if we've got any other ideas. But that's really cool. It looks beautiful. What you can also do if you're teaching online is we can do it just like we're doing now. If you're teaching face-to-face, -face, you if, as long as you've got a computer in the classroom, you can have this on the screen and students can get out their telephones and, and use these word clouds. And then at the end, when it's finished, 
you can print them out, put them on the wall of your classroom or hand them out to students to stick in their books. Uh, it's a really nice way of um, finishing the activity and providing uh, them, them with the words that they uh, have provided you with. All right, let's go back to our presentation. So beautiful work. So that's a way of collaborating um, and, and brainstorming. So just a couple of simple ideas for you to do those simple activities and make them a bit more engaging for our learners. So let's now look at providing a model for discussion and encouraging students to speak. So this was the second part of the, um, of the goals that we had. And again, we have the confidence here. And one of our maxims is leading by example um, and creating trust with our learners. So what we're doing here is we, the third part of the unit opener is we are creating, oh, we are showing our students a video. Now these videos are what we call vlogs. So vlog style videos uh, are two people uh, and they're giving their opposing points of view. So they have to ask this speak your mind question. Is it possible to have a good work and life balance? Well, let's find out. So we what, we play the video. I'm not going to play the video uh, at the moment um, for obvious reasons, but um, they, they will watch the video and one of the people will give a, a yes answer and one will give a no answer. And students will listen to both sides of the argument. This provides them with the support that they need when it comes to the third stage of the cooperative learning which is our group discussion. So students can now look at the words they've created in the Mentimeter, look at the Google Doc, they can look at their own student's book for the vocabulary. The teacher will pull out the language from the discussion in the vlog. So language for maybe giving opinions and have this on the board. This is scaffolding. And then they can have some discussion. They've already seen a model so that they should feel comfortable and confident to be able to give their opinions. Now, if you don't have a video, it's it's good. Cool. You don't need to watch the video. And that's what I love about these questions. Is it possible to have a good work and life balance? Well, I can ask you that question right now and you can answer. You don't need to watch the video. It's not on people watching the video to answer the question. So it's not what does the woman think about work life, about her work life balance. It's asking students, is it possible to have it? It's a really nice question to ask your students. And then it's this point of course. Now, I to progress. I mentioned this earlier in the session. So knowing, knowing you learn this purpose and your goals for learning. And then the importance of training them mentally. All right, let me uh, stop for a moment. Let's see if I'm going to come through the sound. How are you now? Can you hear me okay? No. Okay, let's just, uh, let me just, uh, wait for a second and I will try to, okay.
Okay. All right. Let's keep going. I've uh, I've tried to uh, to turn everything off uh, to see if there's anything else who's sucking from my internet, but it doesn't seem to be. So we'll keep going. Fingers crossed. Say a prayer, and uh, we'll we'll, uh, we'll keep going. All right. So looking at our providing a sense of progress, this is uh, this is really important for students. We, I, I'm sure, as you have learned um, yourself, when when they're learning a language or learning how to do anything, um, we get to a stage that we call the plateau. So the plateau is when we feel like we're not making any more progress. And in fact, we probably are, but it just doesn't feel like we're actually achieving anything. So getting our students over that plateau and showing them that they are learning is very important. And we can do this by providing these word lists here. Yeah, a plateau is, when if you, if you imagine going up a hill and then you get to a plateau, a plateau is a flat area. I should do it this way, shouldn't I? So you go up, you keep keep progressing, and then all of a sudden you plateau out. And that's what students feel like they are doing. Um, they, they, they're not progressing, they're not moving up the mountain. There's another metaphor. Um, and we need to provide them with um, guidance to show them that they are actually progressing. And these word lists, these, these um, ideas we have to um, add words as they go through the unit is very important. And we can also do this by using our uh, signposting, which I'm going to show you right now. So our signposting is at the bottom of the page, and this tells students what they are going to learn. So it says here, in this unit, you will. And then it says, talk about jobs, read about a young woman. There are different areas of the unit that they're going to study. And this, in terms of our maxims as teachers, mm -hmm. this shows students, gives them mental training and helps them create strategies for learning. So. What can we do with this signposting? How can we make this a bit more communicative? Well, we can have fun with a bit of dictation. So as a teacher, you will have the students close their books and you can dictate these uh, the, the uh, aims of the unit to the students. But instead of having students write down the aims after you've dictated them, you can get them to draw pictures. So you will say to the students, close your books. This is what we're going to this is what we're going to study during this unit. So in this unit, you will talk about jobs, members of your family and what jobs they will do. The students will then draw a picture that symbolizes what you have just said. All right. And then you will do that for the next six items from the list or seven items, however many they are. After that, students will then get up and they will walk around and they will tell each other, show each other their pictures and tell each other about what they're going to learn in the unit. This kind of just mentally prepares them for what's about to happen throughout that unit, throughout the uh, their course of study in that unit. You can also use these really cool um, signposting to flip the classroom. Now, you may have heard of flipping the classroom before, particularly with teenage students so this flipping the classroom in this in essence is getting students to do homework and then come to the classroom prepared ready to communicate so the homework would be looking at some of the content rather than the actual production uh, in the classroom so this is a nice way of flipping the classroom you would break these up into groups so everybody would go away and find out about the first item all right, so this is talking about jobs, members of the family, and what jobs they do. Then they all come back and they tell each other about the members of their family and what jobs they do. So they all work together. Then you put students into groups. Group A would look at the next two. Group, excuse me, group B would look at the following two, and then group C, the last two. Then after doing some research, they come back into the classroom at the end, of the, after the, uh, after a uh, in the next lesson, and they would get into groups comprising of a student from A, a student from B, and a student from C. And they would then tell each other what they're about to study during that unit. 
the really nice thing about doing something like this is it, it, it prepares students, obviously, for what they are doing. It makes them accountable for uh, what they're about to learn. And also, it gives them a bit of collaboration within the group. Students are more likely to do the work, I feel, if, they're, if the peers have done their work as well. So rather than if you ask the students to go away and research it by themselves, they might do it, they might not. But if they have to then tell somebody about what they have done, then it's more likely they will do the work. Speaking practice. So we, as I said, we must give them opportunities to practice. If we don't give students an opportunity to practice, then there's, there's no more, they're not going to be confident communicators. So we, I've shown you in the unit openers how we can do that. And as you go through a unit, you will see there's many opportunities, pre-reading and listening, there's discussions, grammar and vocab, there are thinking skills and language and life sections that provide uh, opportunities to speak. And every single lesson within Speak Your Mind has a dedicated speaking section. So let's have a look at one of these. Now, before we do that, I'm going to look at another metaphor. So what can you see in the picture? Yes, nice, Colin. Yeah, perfect. But wait, right? Yeah. Scaffolding. Chinese characters, for sure. And what is the scaffolding doing? What is it doing, the scaffolding? It's scaffold. Yes. Yeah, Providing support, isn't it? Yeah. Kind of. Sometimes, yeah. I think in this in this case, yeah, it's helping to support the, the guys who are who are renovating the building, right? So it's providing support. And that is what we talk about when we talk about scaffolding in English language teaching. We're providing support for our students, whether it be with instructions or with language. So the speaking task how to build a fundamental foundation for your learners and care for your learners. So here's an example of a speaking task. It's got clear instructions and it's got these confident communicator boxes, which help us to check, uh, which help us to uh, continue a conversation. So there's an example. They have to um, look at a picture. They have different pictures to each other and they will find those in the back of their books and they have to describe their picture to each other and then draw a similar picture. So kind of a few stages to this kind of activity, a few stages that we need to be ready for. Yes, we need to scaffold our students for. So what we have done already during the unit is we have taught the language and we have studied the vocabulary and the students should be ready to then do a, a task okay but to do the task they will also need some scaffolding so the first thing the students have to do is look at a picture it says student a look at your picture do not show it to student b so student b also has to look at a picture so all they need to do beforehand is is look at the pictures and see what's in the picture so they need to know the vocabulary in the picture so beforehand, we might want to do some brainstorming, similar to what we did with the unit opener, um, and get these words on the board. Make sure that they're ready for students to use. Now, we can do this very easily. Um, you as a teacher beforehand will look at the pictures and note down the vocabulary that they need to do the task and then play a game with them, such as um, same as the teacher. So what you would do is have a list of the words that they need and have them brainstorm in groups. And then they would get a point for every word that is the same as you on your list. So it's a nice way of checking that all the words that they need are actually covered on the board. Get them on the board ready for the students to use. Students then complete the first part. So they look at their pictures now and they can check together the words that they need. Now we need to get the language. So the language we're using for this activity would be there is and there are. Prepositions of place and the furniture items. Well, the furniture items are already on the board. 
So what we need now, maybe we would bring a picture in, maybe something personal of our own room and ask students to describe the picture. And from that, you would elicit there is, there are, and these prepositions of place. Get the language on the board so that they can see it, so they're able to then use it. Prepare learners to be ready. And then after that, you can introduce the confident communicator boxes. So with these boxes, we're getting students to keep talking. So we're checking understanding using the word right. So for example, it says the bed is next to the door, right? So you might want to do some work here on pronunciation, the rising intonation when you check understanding. You might also think your students can do more, right? Than just say right, right? So you might want to then consider adding other language and teaching some other language to help students to keep talking. You might want to introduce some more complex question tags if you think they're up to it. The bed is next to the door, isn't it? The bed is next to the door. Am I correct? And this kind of language so that they have other ways of, of using these uh, strategies to keep talking. Now, the Confident Communal box, Boxes teach our strategies. And as you can see, we've got the keep talking in the middle here, but we also have start talking and repair it. So these three key areas, when you're asking students to communicate, are key areas to build that confidence to help students communicate. So when you're thinking of doing a speaking activity, think about the strategies that they need to start a conversation, to keep it going, and very importantly, to repair our conversation. Because often when we're learning a language, we're going to have problems when it comes to actually understanding. So we need this language to repair. Can you repeat that? Please say it again. Can you say it more slowly? And one of the, the, the great things about communicating with people face to face is that we can ask them, we, we can control the conversation. It's not like listening uh, something on a TV where you cannot stop, rewind and play it slowly. You, you can ask people to do that. It's a very uh, simple way of repairing conversations. Students would then complete the activity and they would change roles. Or so student A would now become student B and they would complete it again. But by this time, they would change partners. And you as a teacher, as you would do, if you're building a building, you take away the scaffolding once it's finished. So you would take away the language from the board when you feel your students are confident enough to use the language. You can add, add you can put it back up if they need more support, but you can also take it away to show them how they can do the activity now without any support. And this in a, in a, also provides a sense of progress. All right, I'm just looking. We can't get the module because, we, OK. So just to recap on this slide, because I think we've had a couple of internet problems. So these, these strategies, they need, to be, uh, they need to be taught in order for students to be able to start a conversation, to keep a conversation going, and to repair our conversations. And I think repairing is very important for students to have this ability to control a conversation by asking people to repeat things, to speak slowly, to say it again in a different way. Asking people to paraphrase is a nice way. And then finally, having worked um, with their partner, they change roles, work with a different partner, and then make sure you personalize activities. So with this activity, they were looking at a picture of a room, ask them to take a photo of their own room and bring it in and repeat the activity, maybe as a warmer in the next lesson, uh, using their own um, rooms to discuss and talk about. And this is a nice way of bringing it together. Okay, so we're coming towards the end of our session and I've got some questions for you now. I'd like you to speak your mind. So I gave you three key areas for building confident communicators. So building confidence, providing opportunities and teaching strategies um, and, and practicing those strategies. Keep talking, repair, talk and start talking. 
So can you, in the chat box, can you give me ideas that you have to create a classroom environment in which your students feel motivated? So can we add anything to this three-step approach? And write it in your chat box. Cool, role plays, yeah. Yeah, nice to break it up, isn't it? Playing games is very, yeah, it's good fun, motivating. I add an element of competition as well, which often motivates students. Jokes, yeah, my jokes aren't very good. That's the only problem. So we're seeing role plays and games. Drilling can be fun as well, yeah. Good, good, yeah. Little gifts for your students, for sure. Kahoot is obviously very interactive, yeah. Guess. Cool. Praising is important, yeah? And praise them for their efforts, not just the um, their what they've achieved, but actually how they achieved it. All right, this is really a really nice way, a nice way of praising students. Creates a growth mindset. Lovely, so some really nice jigsaw activities, some nice ideas coming through there. Cool. I think if you're doing all these things, we can see the word games comes through a lot. Obviously, students love playing games, right? And the, the more communicative, yeah, constructive criticism, the more communicative these games are, then the better they will feel when it comes to um, communicating. And then if we go back to our maxims, so I've got seven things a teacher should know now. So here were my, the ones that I chose. So can you now, can you speak your mind and give me another maxim for letter G? All right, what would you add to letter G? All right, I've given you six. Can you go, or the coach, my boxing coach gave me six. Can you add another one? Very nice, yeah, learn responsibility, yeah. Making them accountable, right? Ah, impress your learners, Kim, yeah. Learner autonomy, yeah, I think that's that's a really is a key area, isn't it? An autonomous learning, right? I like it. Building rapport, training their senses. Yeah, I think some of these might actually fit into to some of the others. So constructive feedback might be actually in care for learners. If you're not giving feedback, then you're not really caring for them. Building their critical thinking, yeah. Adapting emotionally, all these are really cool ideas. Encouraging our learners for sure. And that comes in with praising as well and encouraging. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to open up our Q&A. And I would like you to give me any questions that you might have. So I've opened up the Q&A. So if you've got any questions, then please let me know. And I also have a survey for you to complete, as always. And your, your, um, as I said, your your information that you give us on the survey, we take into account. We do look at it. We do use it for uh, future training opportunities. So we're very grateful for you for completing these surveys for us. So please take a moment after the end of the session to complete that. So does anybody have any questions? So the first one, how to make a good classroom environment. So I think this goes back to our key, our key maxims. I think if you follow those key maxims um, of the, the fighter and the trainer, then I think you will be automatically creating a good classroom environment for your students. I think one of the key areas is that first one for me is getting to know your students. Who are they? Why are they learning? What's the reason for them learning? If they are, if they are children, so if they are uh, children, then they're likely being told to go by their 
by their parents. So they might not have answers to this. So you need to create an environment that's fun and safe for them. If they're adults, then they will have real goals. And you need to make sure that what you do in the classroom is working towards those goals. Classes with mixed abilities. Well, you're always going to have classes with mixed abilities, right? And we could do a whole session on how to manage a class with mixed abilities. But again, one of your key areas is finding out what those mixed abilities are. Now, you might have students that are strong um, across the board in all skills. They're just your best student. But they will also have a mixed ability in what they can do as well. So a good needs analysis, a good diagnostic assessment at the start of a course is really important to find out what strengths and weaknesses your students have and then working out your own strategies to help them uh, within that. If you have an activity like a reading activity and you've got 10 questions that they have to an answer, then your strong students can an answer 10 questions and your weaker students, they can answer five. So break up the activity that you're doing for the level of your students. How to make silent students confident to speak up. Again, create a safe environment. Show them, give them a model for learning. Show them um, how uh, by, by scaffolding on the board, by giving them the language that they need, they can use, and then taking it away and showing them what they can do and how good they are. Don't focus on the mistakes, focus on what they do well. Obviously correct them when they need to, but if you're doing a fluency activity, then don't focus on the mistakes. If you're doing an accuracy activity, then concentrate on the stakes. Praise them for their achievement, praise them for their effort, um, and make sure that they feel um, comfortable and safe to make mistakes. I think that covers the other questions as well about shy students and boosting their confidence. It's giving them the scaffolding, giving them the, the um, opportunities and the language they need to speak. We can't expect students just to come up with language. We have to give it to them and then remove it when we feel that they have that language. I think with big classes, with large classes, again, this is a question we have a lot, is how to manage large classes. With large classes, I like to break them up into smaller groups within the large classes. So if you have a group of 30, you can break them up into six groups of five and then have a leader within that group so that when you're talking to the groups you're talking really to five people and then they manage the class for you within those groups and change the leader often change the groups often as well um, and don't get too focused on uh, being too teacher centered um, even with large classes you can still get them to do pair work and group work activity by move just moving their heads around and that kind of thing, rather than moving them around physically. Look for opportunities as well. If the classroom itself is too small, look for opportunities to get out of the classroom and uh, into the, the corridor if you're not too noisy or into the playground as well. Ah, that's a, that's a really good question. How do you pacify overconfident communicators? Well, well, that's the opposite of uh, shy students, isn't it? I think if you've got, for me, an overconfident communicator, it, it's worth having a word with them after the lesson. Um, or maybe if you do have a, a communication uh, with your students, um, is, to, is to tell them um, what you're going to be doing. If it's be, maybe before the lesson, actually, tell them what you're going to be doing and tell them the time that you would like them to participate. And you just need to know who they are. Often a, OK. I know you know the answer, but I want this person to answer. Complicate those, giving them uh, recognition that you know what they can do, but you want someone else to participate at this time. This is just a communication be be between you and that, commun that, that student. You don't want to stop them from not participating, right? Um, but it is often um, a challenge if they're communicating too much and not letting anybody else talk. So the the, uh, the the record the the PowerPoint the the presentation has been recorded and that will be made available to you at the end of the uh, session. Okay, I'm just looking through the, the questions. Um, we've got big classes, concentrate a lot. And again, I think that 
ex overachieving, overactive students motivated in the classroom is a good pro problem to have. And again, I just m finding out who they are and talking to them individually is a good way. Okay, well, that kind of brings us to the end of our session. And I just want to say um, thank you so much for participating. We have another session coming up next week with John, who's going to talk about classroom management. Uh, but this is the last session that I will be delivering in this series. Thank you so much for your um, support uh, to uh, these webinars and to uh, Macmillan. And also, I just want to take this opportunity now to say thank you to the, the team the, the team in China that have put on these webinars, that have worked behind the scenes uh, to make these webinars a success. Um, I apologize for the internet connection uh, not being great today, but that's something often we can't control and we just have to work around. But thank you to the team. Thank you um, to you all for participating. And I hope to see you face to face in the not too distant future. Take care and all the best.